Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Lit Service, where we're fans of fiction and purveyors of dodgy writing advice. I'm Aaliyah and I misunderstand cats. <laughs> so okay. Just, like, I used to understand them and actually I don't, so. Okay. I'm Kristen and my favorite misunderstood thing is Zuko. <laughs> I'm Caitlin and I misunderstood what we were supposed to be talking about. <laughs> I'm Cameron, and I am not a fan of how most people misunderstand where the definition of words come from. I'm going to be a nerd on this one. Like prescriptivism? Uh, you're saying you're, pres you're, that's part you're of descriptivist? Formalism, okay. structuralism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All, all, all that. Fancy. Oh, am I supposed yeah, to? You can do it. Yeah, oh, gosh. You don't have to if you don't want to. Well, it's fine. Um, uh, I didn't realize that I had to go. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Kelly Barnhill, and um, I'm actually, I, I actually understand everything, so uh, you, you're all fine. <laughs> oh, right. perfect. Believe it. Then we well, really need you here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, as you have guessed, we have Kelly Barnhill on the show today. Kelly, we are thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Um, she received the Newbery Medal in 2017, won the World Fantasy Award, the Parents' Choice Gold Award, as well as many other honors. She is a New York Times bestseller and the author of The Girl Who Drank the Moon, The Witch's Boy, Iron Hearted Violet, and the mostly true story of Jack, as well as the novella The Unlicensed Magician. So today, because we all enjoyed The Girl Who Drank the Moon so much, and um, the layers of misunderstanding that, books ha that book has, we wanted to talk about misunderstandings that make action rise rather than flop on its face. Hmm. So we have this classic trope of awfulness in mostly genre romance and YA that if two characters would just talk to each other, there would be no plot. With that being said, how do we go about creating a misunderstanding that drives character action in a way that feels true? Might have to defer to this to oh, yeah. you, I feel like, because... Yeah, I mean, in the end, um, uh, I, I do I do agree that uh, the the situation that we'll see in fiction where um, uh, where the where the misunderstanding is obvious that can be really frustrating because it can be solved so easily. But when misunderstandings come from a deeply held worldview, right, where uh, where both characters are fundamentally correct from their point of view. Right, that's where things get much more interesting, I think, um, and where um, where somebody can have a um, uh, uh, where there, you can have a situation where there's a misunderstanding, where um, uh, where where two people are seeing a single thing in wildly different ways um, uh, because of their life experience, because of what they're coming at from, and also um, uh, because they are looking at it from one direction or another direction. Right, um, and and I think that that is really the stuff of fiction. Like that's that's where things become more interesting because then both both characters are sympathetic, right? And and both characters are coming at their solutions to a problem uh, that are um, uh, that are correct from their from their point of view. So that's a really good point. Actually, that makes me think of that story of like. A bunch of men who who are blind and oh, they yeah, feel the different elephant. parts of the elephant, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, where, from your perspective, you're only seeing part of the situation, and you think you're looking at a snake when the other person thinks they're looking at like a tree or mm -hmm. something. And I think that's something you pull off really well. But I also think what makes it ring so true is that's where a lot of misunderstandings in real life come from, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. it makes it really relatable and and feel like there's something weighty to it instead yeah. of just like a one sentence would solve this problem. Right, yeah. You know, so there's a book that just came out a couple of days ago called The Lost Girl by Anne Ursu, and it's magnificent. It's a magnificent, magnificent book. And, um, and in, this, um, in this book, it, it centers around um, identical twins who are going into fifth grade, and they've always been together. And for the very first time, they have to be separated. And this feels so calamitous to them and, and insane to them. And um, and from the adults' point of view, they are they are they're doing what's right for these children, um, and so everybody is correct. It is calamitous for them. There are all kinds of terrible things that happen because of this, including you know wacky magical stuff and blah blah blah. <laughs> um, but the adults aren't wrong, 
right? Um, uh, they, they really do want what's best for these children. And, um, and so you have this situation where everybody is acting appropriately, um, and, and yet the, the situation still unravels, right? Mm -hmm. so. so when we were talking about this, I felt like there are a couple of other situations where I, I was okay with the misunderstanding being there. And one of them was if one character had more information than another character. Mm -hmm. And I think you had a good example of I that do, one. but I, I always share from the winner's, the winner's uh, curse. Actually, I think it's the winner's crime that this happens in. But two main characters, um, there's a big final climactic moment at the end. Um, and one of the characters knows that they're being watched uh, mm -hmm. and that there's somebody paying attention to their conversation. And so she feels like she can't she can't say any of the things she actually wants to because she knows it will get them both in trouble. And so we have one character who's like, no, I need the truth from you and I need it now, while the other character is like, I can't say anything, so I have to be as mean to you as possible to make you go away and maybe keep the trust of the person watching us. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a reader, it's really cool to to have all the details when you know some of the characters don't mm -hmm. um, because it just really builds the tension. Um, and that's... As Caitlin well knows, that's uh, why I love that series anyway, is <laughs> mm -hmm. the tension is so strong with mm -hmm. everyone having, having different pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I feel like another, like there are so many situations in books where I feel like just having a tiny bit more information would have like stopped all of the calamitous things from happening. But um, I think that if the characters truly believe or are passionate about whatever it is that's happening, mm -hmm. which is kind of like what you're talking about, but I was thinking more like Romeo and Juliet, where if they were perhaps slightly less crazy teenagers, and they mm -hmm. might have stopped for a second mm -hmm. to like find out a little bit more information before everyone, you know, got into their terrible situation. Right. People died. Right. <laughs> Poison. Poison. Stabbing. Yeah. The list that goes on. Yeah. So that's yeah. probably the perfect example, and it seems like we're already talking about this already, but how can we intentionally use those misunderstandings to cause tragedy or to pit characters against each other? Yeah, I mean, in um, uh, I mean, one thing we talk about in fiction is this notion of setting the clock, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so we have, you know, we have something that we have something that is going to happen in time, and that is fixed, right? And um, uh, and 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 so that can't be changed, and we can't change the, the the passage of time, but the the characters can change what they do in the in the meantime, right? And as we get closer and closer to that fixed moment, um, uh, the tension goes up and up and up. Well, the, thing, the same thing can happen uh, with rate of revelation of, um, of information. Um, that if if the um, if the reader is privy to a set of a set of information, especially if it is um, a, or a set of facts that um, uh, that and particularly if they are um, uh, directly related to you know whatever like fixed moment in time that like everything is sort of heading towards, um, I. To, to see a character um, uh, behave with you know the wrong set of facts right um, uh, that that will um, that not only um, uh, increases tension but it also increases the sense of pacing right mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, um, yeah it's um, uh, it's a very it's a it's a cool trick you know when you can master it mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite things, and I'm going all over our outline, I'm sorry, Leah. Yeah. Oh, one so of my cool. favorite things is when you have two characters that are functioning from a different set of facts or different worldviews, and you have a third character who can see both sides, mm -hmm. but can't intervene mm -hmm. for whatever reason, mm -hmm. because it's so much more delicious for the reader, because they're in that, in that point of view. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you have like an impartial person watching, or if you have a witch stuck as a, as a bird. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And I can't get out of this stupid bird yeah. <laughs> body. Yeah, it's really, yeah. It's really <laughs> problematic, actually. <laughs> yeah, but it makes for delicious reading because yeah. you're sitting here and you're like, the person with the answers is right there. Please right listen. There, just give her a seed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a worm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I think because the reader can be that impartial party, um, any one viewpoint in the story doesn't have to have all the tension because mm -hmm. the reader can get a little bit of their tension here and a little bit there. So the reader is really tense without the story necessarily having to be overboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. I was thinking about this in terms of how you can use it comically as well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like the importance of being earnest. Yeah. Where you have the two women 
who I can never remember anybody's names. But Gwendolyn, is Gwendolyn, one of them. and then <laughs> um, CC Cecily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, who both believe that they're um, engaged to Ernest. <laughs> yes, and they are different men mm -hmm. who are neither of them are named Ernest. Right. But when they finally get into the same room, they're like, I'm engaged to Ernest Worthing. And the other one's like, but I am also engaged to Ernest Worthing. <laughs> yes. And yes. I was engaged to Ernest Worthing yesterday instead of a week ago, so I win. You know, yes. like, And they're not even talking about the same person, but I love that mis misunderstanding, which could have been mm -hmm. cleared up in just a second. Right. But because they're are both so passionate about what it is that they're talking about. They never, they don't clear it up. And actually, most of the misunderstandings in the rest of that play. I love. I love. I love that they're like favorite. comparing their their diaries. To I know. I know. Uh, so that I can have something it's thrilling to read on the train. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll find that I have prior claim. Yeah. yeah. I just love it. I know. It's such a good play. Oh, so good. Yeah. And that really is the genius of it, though. Is it, it's it's really the source is the misunderstanding and then just the humor that comes mm -hmm. It makes me so happy. I, I want to go and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's mostly, I mean, that's pretty much what we're talking about in all cases. We have to believe that the characters are either passionate enough or fixed in their worldview enough mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to continue in their path without stopping to get more information. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. it to work. Yeah, no, totally, totally. So stepping it back then to a basic question, how mm -hmm. do you create a misunderstanding that doesn't fall into the trope of being frustrating. Do you start with that character motivation, or do you start with the end in mind, or how do you how do you approach it? Well, I mean, when I was writing *Girl Who Drank the Moon*, um, I wasn't. I mean, I was lo looking at under misunderstandings on a on a on a much larger scale, right? Um, because I was really interested in this notion of false narratives and um, and and how we can take a set of facts. Um, that are verifiably true, but when they are cast in, um, uh, when we tell them this way, they become correct, and we, so when we tell them this way, they become false, right? Um, and uh, um, and so yeah, the way that I wanted to set that up, of course, with, in *Girl Who Drank the Moon*, was um, uh, through this device of of the storyteller, um, uh, you know, this some adult that was tr that was speaking to some child, and it's never identified who the adult is. But all of the things in those stories are all completely true, right? Um, it's just that the stories are wrong, right? And, um, and you know, I, when I talk to students, I, I, um, I kind of explain, that, uh, explain it to them, um, uh, you know, just you know, imagine a situation where you're sitting in the kitchen with your little brother and, um, uh, uh, and your mother walks in and um, the box of cereal is, com is dumped entirely onto the floor. And your mother looks at you and said, what did you do? <laughs> right? Now, the facts are, are obvious, right? The, the cereal is dumped on the floor. But the story may not be true. It may not have been you. Um, uh, that is the narrative that she is the, that she is drawing based on the facts that she knows, and we do this all the time. We we're narrative thinkers. We we think in story. We uh, process information in story. We remember in story, and we plan for the future in story. This is just what we do, and and that is awesome unless it's not, right? Um, and uh, um, and so those fundamental misunderstandings can cause all kinds of big problems when they become these like cultural stories that we tell. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, you know, how we, how we justify war is um, narrative. How we justify racism is narrative. How we justify sexism is narrative. How we justify atrocities, it's all narrative. Right, and all of it comes from these places of misunderstanding. Right, and so that, and and so I went into writing this book really intentionally, um, uh, wanting to, you know, sort of like get at that. Right, um, uh, because um, uh, stories are good unless they're not. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I want that on a T-shirt. <laughs> that actually reminds me of a TED Talk called um, "The Danger of a Single Story." Yes, I know it's that so one. So great. So, mm -hmm. listeners, you should go look that up. It's yes. about how we tell ourselves, or how stories are told to us in one single way, and it, it narrows our view of how people can be 
and yeah. compulsive read honors. Yeah, I have a lot of friends who are journalists, and um, in the period of time uh, following Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. um, uh, journalism really had to take a really hard look at itself uh, in the role of bias. Um, because um, not only sort of biased language and biased word choice, you know, I'm going to call the, this group of people scavengers, and I'm going to call this group of people looters. Yeah. And um, uh, and boy, oh boy, isn't it interesting how there's like a direct um, uh, correlation to skin tone, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then also, you know, economic bias and um, and geographic bias, and there were all kinds of you know stories like that were coming out of the Superdome that turned out to be wildly false and yet they were repeated again and again and again and people just thought they were true because it it um, uh, it coincided with all kinds of pre-existing biases about mm -hmm. you know um, uh, race class culture you got geography and income mm -hmm. that is so interesting yeah. I love that and so incorporating that into the writing into your writing all you had to do is really look around in the world and yeah. that in yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this has been a fun discussion. Does anyone have any final thoughts before we, <laughs> we switch on to the critique portion of this podcast? I'm just basking in the misunderstanding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, wonderful. We have a fun submission we're going to talk about today. Um, a quick review. We try to keep this part of the podcast non-prescriptive most of the time. And if you'd like to check out, check out the text of the submission and see all of our notes, check on our website, litservicepodcast.wixsite.com slash litnation. If you would like a first crap chapter critique from us, you can find our submission guidelines there. So in this submission, we have a young girl, Maddie, who loved listening to her grandfather's stories about meeting monsters all over the world, and she believed them. She attends his funeral, her grandfather's, wondering if his death was an accident. So let's talk about some things we like. I think the first line is an mm -hmm. awesome first line. I think it's a great place to start the book. Um, the first line is, Natty Good had a monster problem. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of builds on that throughout. And I think they did a really good job establishing that as a, not just a voicey thing, but also a character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because character and voice, they they have to be together, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, it is the same. Um, the way that we establish the voice is the um, uh, it's the um, it's how we establish the relationship between the reader and the character, um, and so everything is revealed in that way. And it does a really good job. I, I liked. I, I just like the sense of sympathy that we um, that we that we establish right away um, uh, um, in our relationship with Maddie, and and primarily, you know, that that's not only. I mean, we have that sense of sympathy partially because of her sense of otherness, but also in her um, connection to you know both her grandfather, which is very real and very sincere, uh, but also in her connection to her friend as well. And her understanding too that um, uh, that her friend doesn't totally see eye to eye with her, but supports her anyway. You know, that that's a really sort of, um, that was a lovely moment I thought. Mm -hmm. I should let you have a chance to talk. <laughs> um, I'll second that I really liked um, the beginning point of the book because mm -hmm. not only do we get a whole bunch of characterization in relation to her grandfather because obviously her grandfather is very important was a very mm -hmm. important figure in her life but it's also a you know a liminal crossing threshold moment mm -hmm. where oh so one chapter of my life where i have my grandpa around is ending and we're starting this new section where oh he's in a coffin right and now we have to deal with that and how she handles that situation is a beautiful window for the author to give us characterization yep. mm -hmm. but also you know, drop nice little hooks everywhere for us to say, okay, well, what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's, it's an event charged with emotion that people can relate to. Yeah. I actually really liked that line where that change takes place. Um, there's this great reversal where it seems kind of like lighthearted, like to have a monster mm -hmm. problem is great. But then she says, um, she's talking about coffins, and then she said, but this was her first experience with a real one. And then that's where the tone changes. Yeah, um, yeah um, irrevocably, yeah, yeah, for sure. I also, um, I really liked that it ends with a great question. It ends with us, well, her sort of feeding us the question, like, what happened in my grandfather's office? Why mm -hmm. did it catch fire? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After we find out that he's spent so much time telling her these stories about how he's met with these monsters in real life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Agreed. I, I also felt like the flashbacks where we get those snatches of conversation with her grandpa were, were very smoothly inserted. I like to see those. It creates a really great juxtaposition just between this this like iconic like childish wonder and innocence 
with not so much. Like the grandfather even mentions, like you know, I was in Dracula's castle and I spent the night in a coffin. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's very grandpa to granddaughter. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at that and say, okay, yeah, really? sure, grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> but then grandpa's in a coffin and he's not getting out of this one. Yeah, yeah, so yeah that's for it's, sure. I don't for know, sure. There's, there's a lot of really great parallels mm -hmm. throughout. I thought. Mm -hmm. Also, I just think Phoebe Bumble is a great name. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. All right. Well, let's move on to things that might need a second look. Um, though I liked the coffin reversal, um, I felt like there were a couple of really stark tone shifts, mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't really sure what to expect for the rest of the book. Yeah. I feel like a first chapter really needs to set up what kind of story is going to be told, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure finishing this chapter of what kind of story I'm headed into. Agreed. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the best um, uh, uh, workshops I've ever attended was taught by Arthur Levine. Um, and, um, and it was about imagining a first chapter as a first date. And um, because we communicate all kinds of stuff on our first date, and we um, uh, uh, we communicate, you know, not only you know what we're willing to offer, but what we're looking for, you know, because the the, the text itself needs to be looking for something. It's looking for a very particular kind of reader, right? Because it's not the writer who makes the story; it's the reader who makes the story. So um, uh, the the text itself needs to look for a, a reader who's up to the task. Um, and, and, and that does get meddled here. Um, if this person was my student, um, uh, what I would say um, is um, that I, I, would love, I would love the, um, the notion of a monster problem, which is established at the beginning, to be repeated at the end. Um, I, and, um, and, um, and, and I would love for, um, uh, to maintain that sense of tone, um, uh, throughout, um, uh, because it's so good and it's so interesting. And, um, and then we, I think, you know, in some ways, because I think that this is a story that takes on a lot and it's, it's hard to know what to do in a, in a first chapter when you have that. But I think that a lot of newbie writers, uh, make the mistake of wanting to put everybody into the first chapter mm -hmm. and you don't have to do that actually it's too hard it's too hard as a writer it's too hard as a reader too mm -hmm. um, and so I think that um, uh, if the writer is able to sort of clarify that and bring it in a little bit it's going to be easier to write first of all it's going to be a little bit more fun mm -hmm. and it's going to allow for a jumping off point into everything else rather than feeling like everybody's got to be here because um, mm -hmm. they don't have to I, I did feel a little bit overwhelmed by the number of characters we yeah. introduced to. And yeah. actually, um, even though it was nice to get some context for the grandfather, I felt like the switching back and forth in, in timeline was confusing. Yeah, and, and it sort of, it made the first chapter feel like it stopped and started rather than just yeah. moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of my biggest problems um, is just that the main character wasn't being very pro-taggy throughout. Um, she, she was being passive rather than active uh, mm -hmm. in more formal. We were so. observing and setting the stage rather yeah, than exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. Which can be fine for it a first can, chapter, um, uh, but uh, but the way you do that, if, if, if that's what you want to do, and that's fine, um, uh, the way to do that is to really be ruthless in your control of the tone. Um, uh, I, because when the tone gets all over the place and you've got a, a, a character who is um, observing rather than, um, uh, than acting, then, um, then that can get too messy, right? Um, uh, uh, whereas um, uh, it, it, it's fine if you have them observing if the tone itself and the, and the voice itself becomes its own vehicle, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and you know, and honestly, I, I think I think the writer is there. Like I think I think that that's not going to be hard. You know, um, I think the pieces are there. I think the tools are there. Um, I think um, I um, I think that um, uh, by um, uh, by condensing and by really focusing on um, uh, how the story is telling itself, right, um, uh, and um, it, it's. It, it'll fix it, you know. I, th I think that all of these things are, are wildly fixable. Actually. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Because it's, it's really a strong start, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, maybe just to, there are a couple of really nitpicky small mm -hmm. things. I noticed a few voicey things that I had questions about, like, um, like talking about REM. Right. Mm -hmm. I was wondering yeah. 
where she got that. Right. right. Yeah. No, that's a grown-up talking and not a kid talking. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Unless she's super interested in that, and I would have liked to know that before she started talking. About yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and it, but it wasn't, you know, and again, um, uh, I mean, one of the things that we have to think about, especially as middle grade authors, is, um, uh, is you know, really focusing on each sentence and what each sentence says and what each sentence does. Like, our sentences are, are um, uh, I mean, it's one of the things that, you know, w we talk about when we're, you know, when we're talking about w what what a middle grade book is doing, we're talking about the sentence level, right? And um, uh, each sentence has to do more than one thing. Um, uh, each sentence is its own tool, and each sentence needs to stand on its own feet, right? And that isn't always happening here. I think it's gonna happen, you know? Um, and and so so again, when we have something like that, like an extraneous um, uh, uh, you know, detail like REM sleep, it's, um, uh, uh, it, it actually isn't doing anything, right? Um, uh, it isn't really servicing our understanding of the of the character. It isn't pushing the story forward, and so it isn't really necessary, you know. So anyway. Something to think about as you go through your chapter again. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but um, uh, but I do. I mean, um, uh, uh, in terms of like the fundamentals, in terms of you know what's at stake of the story, um, uh, uh, in terms of you know um, creating well-rounded characters, and in terms of um, uh, uh, having a um, uh, a narrative voice that is compelling, I think that I think it's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Are there any final notes on the submission before there, we... Okay. There was one small section I wanted to draw attention to. Maybe I'm going to add a problem with this, but there's a bit where I think it's in a flashback where um, I think it's her brothers. They're talking about this thing they've invented that's like a security system that can detect people's DNA. Yeah. That felt a little clashy with what we already seen. Um, yeah. I wasn't sure how serious to take it. Like, are the brothers like, oh, we invented this thing. Right. And it's just like a colander taped to a spatula. Right. Or, is this, or did they actually the... invent this piece of super science? I wasn't sure. Right. It felt more like a chapter three thing to be <laughs> in there. You know what I mean? Like, it was, um, uh, uh, these are the thing, um, uh, uh, you know, chapter one really does something very specific. I mean, one of the things that, um, uh, one of the things I like to tell my students is to do a close read of chapter one of whole Holes, um, or actually chapter one through three of holes, um, I, and and to do a close read of chapter one of um, of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in terms of what you can do um, uh, with by paying attention to economy. You know, um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is amazing. You know, you get through. You know, there's not very many words on every page. You know, by the end of the first page and a half, you know all of the kids, and you know how they feel about everybody else. And by the time you get to page five, they're already in the wardrobe. They're already in the wardrobe. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I, I mean, what he's able to do is really amazing. And um, and so I make all of my students really study the heck out of that <laughs> chapter. So I'm very exacting. So. <laughs> All right, listeners, so you have your homework. Yes, and there will be a test on Tuesday. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, thank you, Kelly, again for coming on the show. We loved having you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, if you'd like a first chapter critique from the podcast, you can find our submission guidelines on our website, litservicepodcast.wixsite.com slash litnation. If you weren't chosen this week, feel free to submit again for future episodes. Remember, you can watch the video feed of this recording on YouTube, or you can listen wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us ratings, reviews, and comments. It helps others to find the show. If you like us, please share the show with your friends. If you want to ask us questions or tell us we're awesome, you can find us on Twitter at Lit Service <laughs> or on Facebook and Instagram at Lit Service Podcast, or you can email us at litservicepodcast at gmail.com. Lit Service is brought to you by Writer's Clearinghouse. Writer's Clearinghouse empowers authors and agents by providing low-cost, professional evaluations of entire manuscripts that tell you exactly where your manuscript stands and what you can do to improve it. To learn more, visit www.writersch.com. Listeners of Lit Service will receive 20% off an evaluation by using the code LITSERVICE20 at purchase. For Lit Service, thanks for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks.